John Scully so aptly reminded us in our last session, the world continues to change, whether we're ready for it or not. No more telling is that this potential conflict than in the intimate relationship between doctor and patient. Is the shift going well? We're expected to be informed consumers, but are we any healthier? And is communication with our healthcare provider getting better or worse? Well, our next panel will look at these questions, and especially at whether technology might be able to bridge or even avoid gaps that may arise between us and our physicians. Here to moderate our session is Zachary Bunak. Did I get it right? Perfect. <laughs> A senior research an analyst with the Frost and Sul Sullivan North America Healthcare Practice. Zachary focuses on emerging trends, technologies, and market dynamics in the patient monitoring industry in North America. Since joining Frost and Sullivan in 2007, Zach has been specializing in ECG and heart monitoring services and products. I'll let you take it from there. Thank you, Jill. All right, so another great panel we have here, and we really have a great topic to really talk about. Most of the panels so far have at some point or another really brought up this really important point, which is the doctor-patient relationship. Uh, my name is Zachary Bonock. I'm going to walk over here and get the clicker so I can forward the slides. All right. And the rest of the time I'll be sitting here because it's quite a comfy chair. <laughs> so um, as an analyst, I get a pretty unique position in the market. I really need perspective. I'm a third party observer and influencer sometimes to a market I don't, you know, and I get to see a really neat thing. And so most of the time I'm tasked with trying to figure out what's hype and what's going to be a reality and what's, what's not. Um, and I can sit here and tell you honestly that um, I've seen a lot of hype, I've seen a lot of things over the years, um, over the last five years in this position where, you know, you, you, I knew they weren't gonna, gonna go anywhere. However, I can say quite honestly now that uh, this, is, this is here. This is, the snowball has started um, and now it's kind of up to us as uh, influencers and industry participants to really guide that um, and not, you know, <laughs> destroy any houses further down the hill because we really are only gonna get one shot. Um, we have a really great panel of really diverse and really, really um, knowledgeable panelists here. Um, on the far end is Gene Frantz. He is the uh, TI Principal Fellow at Texas Instruments. Uh, he really is going to bring our technology side of this uh, to, to light. He's a, obviously a huge expert in that. Um, next to him is William Reed. He is uh, from Numera. He is the Product Management uh, Vice President of Product Management at Numera. Um, he's going to provide us with some uh, information around the, the more remote side of healthcare um, outside of the hospital and bringing help into and outside of the hospital. Next, we have uh, Jim White. He's Vice President of Connected Hospitals at Alcatel Lucent. Um, here, we're going to transition into the actual hospital itself, EMRs and payers, so they actually look at that acute care situation and get that perspective. And then finally, we have uh, Alexandra Von Plato, who is the Global President and Chief Creative Officer for Gigitus Health and Razorfish Health, who is really going to bring us a pretty neat perspective on the increasing importance of marketing in healthcare. And so let's see if I can get this going. Okay, so a, a pretty, pretty simplistic slide here. Here's the doctor-patient relationship in its most core form, I think, which is communication between the doctor and the patient. As you can see there, you know, and I'm showing a little bit of frustration on the faces here, but doctors, we're pretty good at showing, you know, at, at, at diagnosing of what's wrong. We're pretty good at saying, okay, you need to stop smoking, you need to eat better, you need to take these medications. And we've done that for years. The patient is, is pretty good at uh, really, intention, uh, really showing an intention to listen to them. I mean, they, people trust their doctors, even all generations, still really see doctors as, as a really ex an expert in what they're talking about, and they should. Doctors usually are. So usually there's a yes, yes, I'm going to try to do that with the best of intentions. But as we all know, that only translates into outcomes about, in some cases, let single digits, 7% of the time, smoking cessation rarely breaks 10% uh, in, in success rate. Um, so this is really where I feel technology is easily explained as the enabler between this doctor-patient relationship. And so here you can start putting technology, some that's been around for quite a long time, some that we're talking about here, when you can really take smoking and put a smoking cessation program that utilizes some sort of cellular network um, to, to, to uh, enable 
a better use of that or to explain it in a better way to the patients. And there's some other ones here, whether it's medication management, uh, diet apps, and et cetera. And hopefully that'll, that'll lead to some happier uh, doctors and happier patients. So finally, I wanted to take, um, I really wanted to give a really brief introduction here and really let the panelists talk because these are the people that really know um, their stuff. And earlier you're gonna give some real examples of why this is already here. Um, but this last slide of mine really is gonna take a step back into what I really do more than anything else is look at the reality of the business in healthcare. Um, and I think this slide really shows the huge complexity and, and scope of what we're talking about here in the doctor-patient relationship. Um, the two axes we have here one is the consumer axis, I mean, one is the, uh, whoever the customer is going to be, and the other is the industry. And you have on one axis professional versus consumer and healthcare versus information communication technologies. Um, and I think this really shows what we're talking about here at the Digital Health Summit, um, which is the collision of professional and consumer because that's really what we're dealing with here. There's always gonna be some sort of interaction on the professional side to really have some sort of clinical outcome. And what we don't do very well, obviously, is have the consumer side of it well. So it's a really smart uh, need is needed here to really do what this, and so obviously we have a bunch of markets here that I'm not gonna go into, um, but as you can see, it's a wide range of things. So with that, I'm gonna pass it on to Gene, uh, principal fellow at TI, and uh, just, hand over. Ah, I only have one slide, I hope. <laughs> uh, I don't like slides. Let's see. Ah, there it is. No, I'll pass it off and I'm done. Uh, but I'm not done talking. I'm just done showing. And, and you can look at that and, and it'll tell you about Texas Instruments. Most of you think Texas Instruments is a calculator company. That is a very minor part of our corporation. What we do for a living is we create silicon. And that makes us, in one sense, the enabler to all of those products we're gonna create in the future. When I personally look at technology, there are three things I hope technology will bring to us. One is, and all three on a personal level. The first is that technology will be able to manage my chronic diseases. Secondly, that technology will be able to predict my catastrophic diseases. And third, that technology will allow me to live comfortably at home the last days of my life. And, and I've had people say, well, why don't we just make it so you don't ever have those last days of your life? Well, I, I think that's the one thing we're pretty sure we're gonna have. And, and as long as I'm comfortable, I, I think that would be acceptable. So that's my goal for the technology. Now, how, what does that have to do with the doctor-patient relationship? Uh, I, I hate to put it simply, but I don't really care. Uh, we're the enable, and, and don't quote me on that. Uh, <laughs> uh, That's getting tweeted. I know, I know. I see it all happening right now. <laughs> okay, so I may be done before I thought. Uh, because what we want to provide, and, and I, I let me speak for the industry of integrated circuits, what we want to provide are platforms for all of you to innovate and create the appropriate doctor-patient relationship. Now, I have a great relationship with my doctor, and, and she's not my wife, uh, <laughs> but, but I've been going to her for 25 or 30 years. My family has gone to her. She was a brand new doctor when we began going to her. We're friends. Uh, it is difficult to get out of the doctor's office in less than a couple of hours because we're talking about family, uh, she likes to hunt. She's a Texan. You, you expect that. Uh, and so there's a lot of things to talk about. So I love the doctor. I, I would hate to lose it. But I believe one of the directions we're going to be allowed to go with technology is for the doctor, in one respect, to become the second opinion because I have technology at my house with me. I give a, a lecture now on that. I, the topic the subject of the lecture is health, don't leave home without it. And it is that idea that we will be able to have all of that technology to give us that first initial opinion and let the doctor, I'll say be the second opinion, but be the final opinion to uh, get you down the right path. On the other hand, uh, I know uh, there's a, a doctor in uh, India that I have visited and, and just impressed as I could be called, uh, his name is Dr. Shetty. 
who has set up a satellite system and so he from his office in the hospital can communicate with patients in the local small communities around India which were almost impossible to get to and have them diagnosis for heart disease while he's watching them from his office in Bangalore and can determine what medication, whether they should come in. It is amazing how much technology he has brought to light to make the doctor-patient relationship be independent of distance. And so at the end of the day, I love the fact that many of the people that use integrated circuits are far more creative than we are that create the integrated circuits. And I'll make one last point. Within the next decade, the way the technology is going, we will be able to put a billion transistors down on a piece of silicon for about one US dollar. I call that a buck a billion. My biggest fear is I can't think of one good application that requires a billion transistors. <laughs> That's your job. You're going to put us out of business if you can't figure out how to use all the technology we can provide to make this a wonderful place. And I'll shut up. Well, that's great. I'm sure, I'm sure healthcare will find a solution to that really quick. <laughs> uh, my retirement depends on it. <laughs> Next, I'll pass it off to uh, Bill here. So <clears throat> as I was thinking about uh, this panel, I, I started looking at a convergence of a, of a couple different uh, statistics that were out there that kind of struck me as, as you know, not, not necessarily a perfect storm, but certainly uh, something that is uh, brewing out there. And so I started putting these together and, and, and really it came to the conclusion for me that we had to have this challenge of, of time, space, and money. Right? And we've heard lots of, of conversation over the last two days here about you know, the cost curve and we have to figure out what we're going to do about the cost curve. In some respects I look at it, there's a lot of other scarcities that exist. It's not just a financial scarcity, but there are actually lots of other scarcities and time and space is one of those elements that is scarce. And when you start looking at this aspect, you know, roughly half the country's population is dealing and managing with a chronic condition. I mean, that's a frightening number for me. When we look at that, though, what is really frightening is the fact that the number of multiple comorbidities, multiple chronic conditions that are piling up in individuals is really rapidly increasing so that we're seeing a patient that doesn't have just hypertension, but has hypertension, hyperlipidemia, diabetes, and potentially obesity. That's placing an increased burden. The other thing is that we have an enormous number of um, uh, new type 2 diabetics that are diagnosed every year. And most of these, you know, people tend to say, well, that's going to be a challenge for the Medicare system. Actually, most of these are going to be diagnosed while they're working during their working lives. This is an issue that actually does matter for um, employers. It's a condition and, and, and a concern for the, for the uh, insurance companies as well. And, and, and it goes on and on and on in terms of when we look at this amount of, uh, of just challenge in terms of lack of time, we have the mean length. I, I found a study that looked at the mean length of the office visit. And we tend to think, hey, it's, you know, I'm in and out. We t tend to say in and out in six minutes or so. It's actually a bit longer than that. But that the mean length of that office is it hasn't really changed. And yet the number of conversations, the number of things that I need to discuss in the course of that very time-bound conversation is increased. These are very complex conditions, and the interactions of those conditions are increasing. And yet I've got a fixed amount of time that frankly hasn't changed over a, over a several decade period. And so we look at the space, and the area that, that um, my company is involved in is, is, you can think of it as remote monitoring, telehealth, uh, telecare, variety of terms uh, to describe that space. And we look at it from the perspective of how do we enable the care that happens when you're not in that time-bound office visit? How is it that we can give doctors the extra long stethoscope? You know, that ability to really be participating in healthcare with a patient when they're not inside the office, when they're not into the constraint of the billable event inside the institution. And somebody will raise the topic, well, how, how's that going to get paid for and all of that. Um, increasingly, the ones that are interested the most are the ones that are having risk. 
so if you ask providers today increasingly, if you ask them about the concept of accountable care or you ask them about the concept of patient-centered medical homes, you'll hear increasingly they're paying attention to the fact that they're going to increasingly take on risk for managing a given population. So the first set of pioneer ACOs under the, by the federal government were just announced about a month ago. Um, those are organizations, provider organizations, that are going to take on risk for a given population. Those are organizations who are going to need to participate in demand destruction in some regard. And they're going to be looking for ways of how do I change the way the model of care happens. The VA has been one example that has had uh, well-studied success in terms of providing remote monitoring services. What's interesting about the VA is that it is really a combination of payer and provider organization. They get a fixed amount of money to care for a population of patients, and that m amount of money is fixed by budget every year. And whether they have the services in a VA hospital or not, they're responsible for providing health care to those service members that they have responsibility for. And so they're trying to find the most cost-effective ways of delivering that care. For patients, it's how do I get the benefit, while I'm in, in my home, I'm not in the doctor's office, how do I get the benefit of having a doctor at home? And so whether that happens in the form of software, whether that happens in the form of guidance, whether that happens in the form of monitoring, how do I help people do what they're in fact already doing and probably have been doing for centuries? And so how do I equip them with some of those technologies to bring that back into the home? And I really do think of technology as a relationship facilitator. Right? Yes, it can get in the way of relationships if we allow it to get in the way of relationships. But I do think that it offers an opportunity to actually facilitate a conversation. There's a well-known effect called the white coat effect that happens with blood pressure measurement when patients walk into a doctor's office. There's some, a certain percentage of patients will have an elevated reading every single time because of the anxiety induced when they walk into the doctor's office. So if I'm a hypertensive patient and I have 12 readings over the course of a year because I go in every month, it's 12 readings of potential white coat effect going on at some point in time. If I did that three times a day, so the American Heart Association says, hey, if you're hypertensive, why don't you measure your, health, your heart rate, your blood pressure and heart rate uh, several times during the day. Over the course of a year, that could be hundreds of data points captured thousand plus data points. That helps me really understand the variation and whether or not I'm getting benefit from the medication and the th various therapies that I've been having a conversation with my doctor about. And so in our company, we really think about a couple things. One is we want it to be simple, inexpensive, and what people know and do. So what we have really focused on is go to what people are already using today. And there are quite a bit of devices that people use today. Most of the market today are using glucometers. Those glucometers, for the most part, are serial connected glucometers. They don't have fancy Bluetooth chips in them. They don't have Wi-Fi capability. You'll see a few of those beginning to emerge, but a vast majority of the measurement systems that are out today use very simple communication technologies. And so we go there and we connect with them because that's what people is in the market today and what we need to be able to support. In other cases, we'll use AMP Plus, we'll use Bluetooth support and a variety of different things, but it's really based on what is available and what are people using and what can we do in a simple way. We'll connect with systems um, that are familiar and that allow for people to consume the information in a way that's familiar to them. So in fact, a lot of what we'll do is on the back end, outbound data that we've gathered off of devices and feed that into EMRs. Why? because the providers want to view the data in the context of the clinical systems that they already use. They don't want to be asked to use yet one more system. They really want to be at being able to see this additional information in the context of the clinical record. And so we provide that information as an inbound HL7 feed and so they can consume that. And so if somebody is using an EPIC EMR, they can be able to have this kind of telemetry information provided to that for that patient in, that, in the context of that record. The other is that we want to engage a patient and allow them to be supported in their activity. And one of the things that we uh, introduced as a platform service is the ability to have what we call Numero Social. And I'll talk uh, briefly about that, um, which actually leverages Facebook. 
Now you heard a comment in the session before this about the challenges of Facebook. We actually look at Facebook from the perspective quite differently. Facebook is a phenomenal distribution mechanism for bringing applications to where people already are. And again, it goes down to our philosophy, work where people are today and facilitate that relationship. People go, well, nearly a billion people are using Facebook. Mark Zuckerberg uses fa commented Facebook has already had an impact in healthcare. We're gonna use that infrastructure and build on that, but we also store that data outside of Facebook. But we take advantage of the social graph capabilities and the fact that there is a place that people go to today when they think about their friends and their relationships, and we can use that as a way of supporting the relationship. So I can set up challenges and a variety of other social activities that benefit from the telemetry data that we've been capturing. And we can flow data from end to end. And so we're allowing for people to go right from one end of the device all the way through to have the ability to have a social, socially supported experience with the friends that they really want to have a relationship with. Very good. We'll go on to uh, Jim here. He's going to bring us back into healthcare itself and uh, really look at hospitals, payers, things like that with some of the fun stuff they're doing. Okay, thanks. How do I do this thing? How do I make it go? That one right there. Oh, that one, okay. So uh, I was at the, uh, um, the, the, the session before with John Scully and he, he was telling uh, about um, one of the brilliant guys who worked for him uh, had a statement, a, um, a statement that went something like this. Um, you can add 80 points to your IQ if you bring a point of view, right? I thought that was a really brilliant comment. So one of the things I'm gonna to try to do here is bring to you a point of view. And the reason I'm gonna do that is because I find the show fantastically interesting because it's the first time I've been to one of these kinds of conferences where it's kind of a consumer looking at healthcare perspective. And one of the things I would say that I sense is this frustration with the system. And part of the reason is that most people perceive the system to be something it is not. So the, uh, let me, this chart here I think does a decent job of kind of reorienting you around what I think the system really is. First of all, let me just tell you something that the system we have in the United States is what I call a heroic healthcare system. It is built around the notion that, you know, something bad's gonna happen to you and then they're going to do something and fix you. That's how the system is built. That's what doctors do. So when you, you want to talk about the patient-doctor relationship, what is it really? You walk into his office, you start to tell him his life story. He's in his mind saying, what am I going to do to you? I have 10 things that I do, and which one of them am I going to do to you? That's how he looks at it. So if you go to a cardiologist, he says, do I cath you? you know? So that's the process that they're going through. Meanwhile, you're standing on their side. He never tells you this, but you're standing there, you're telling your story, and you're, you're not really having the same kind of communication that you think you're having. So what, do, so what does that mean? So you've got three big players. You've got hospitals. So we do this connected hospital thing. We sell a lot of infrastructure to hospitals. And, you know, basically they have this heroic healthcare system packed with technology to do heroic things. MRI machines, hybrid operating rooms. They've got, you know, a hospital is a marvel you know, in terms of technology, um, that sort of thing. And they have the problem that I have all this fixed cost, I need to fill these beds, right? So that's what I'm driving for. Then you have doctors and the clinicians, and wh what's their situation? Their situation is I was trained to do these things. When I do them, I ask somebody to pay me, and they pay me, and that's how my, my whole life works, and that's why we have a whole, you know, our, our health care universe is filled with specialists because the things you get paid for when you're a specialist are higher than the things you get paid for when you're a pediatrician. So, and all these smart guys, every valedictorian in, of our high school went into that industry, right? So, and then finally there's the patients who are getting increasingly dissatisfied because the industry needs to make this transition from being a heroic healthcare system to a system that helps us manage chronic diseases over a long period of time. And that, that's what we're expecting, help me stay healthy, right? Then the system says, what am I going to do to you? So, so there's, that's, the frust that's the point at which I think, that, that to me is the crux of where all the frustration um, comes from today. So the other thing I want, the other comment I think is really important is we talk about this $2 trillion industry and 
Bill and I were talking about this, and you know, it's all it's bad and blah, you know, and it is, and we're consuming too much of our our our, our wealth. The thing that you, we should never forget is somebody's making two trillion dollars. So the status quo is very powerful, right? So at the end of the day, um, you know, the doctors are part of that group who influence, I mean, they're at the center of the evolution of this marketplace. And they've said, you know, this is something from a CIO that I think is really interesting. With all the things that we've done in this industry to try to get information and build this digital picture of patients so that we could reduce testing and all that kind of stuff, supposedly squeeze costs out of it, what we've done is we've asked doctors to do a whole bunch of things to build this picture so that other people can use it. And, and um, you know, it, this was actually a C, the CIO who was responsible for the hospitals at UPMC who made the comment. We've done the EHR, we've taken a bunch of time away from our clinicians, and now it's time to give, we need to find ways to give them back some time, right? So that's one of the challenges that we face, and that's one of the challenges you face when you go into that room. So when you talk about the encounter you have with, a, um, uh, with your doctor, you have this sense that the clock is ticking, he wants to spend a few minutes with me. Well, he's in a, he, he's in a loop, right? His, his, he were, his world revolves around encounters. If I go into his office and he's going to have 30 encounters at X dollars per encounter, that's how his business operates, and he has to figure out how to move you through there. One of the challenges with telemedicine, right, is that if and telemedicine is too expensive. We, there's a lot of cool stuff we're doing in technology. It's too expensive. The transaction costs are too high. It's not systems-based because it doesn't focus on the key thing, which is how do I make the encounter system work better, faster, cheaper, right? So, um, so one of the things that we're working on is this notion of patient-centric telemedicine. And because it, in, in essence, what it really does what we're really trying to do is create a new encounter model. So, um, and we're trying to put the, pa we want the, the patient needs to be at the center of it, but the reality of it is the players around it, the patient's not the center of theirs, of, of their situation. The, pa the patient needs to feel like there's a center of it while all these role players revolve around the patient. So. Today you have all these point-to-point -point encounters that happen, and you, when we talk about PHRs, I love this, when people say, I want my, e my electronic health record in my PHR, and you really have to think, the question I would ask you is, suppose you had your EHR, what would you do with it? Have you ever seen what's in an EHR? It's useless to you. You can't consume it as a person. Right? You have to be a, it's, it's filled with workflow and all these details and lab results you don't understand. Even if I have my MRI image, it's good to look at, but what do I know about it? I can't read it. So, the inf you know, getting the information in the, in the hands of the right people, that's the big challenge. Um, so, so basically, we're, we're working on, uh, in order to address this, we're working on a, a project with the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. We're, we're to, together, we're vil, building a telemedicine platform that we call patient-centered telemedicine. And we're, we're really addressing all the different role players and stakeholders in this. It's so important that you be doing this in conjunction with a provider and you be bringing in the doctors. And we're going to be, we're building workflows for them, the thing they do, right? Um, so that we can drive a super efficient encounters um, and the patient, really, the patient's experience is a series of different encounters. I move through time, right, and I have a series of different encounters. First, I go into my primary care physician. He does a discovery. He steers me over to this certain kind of specialist. He does what he does. Imagine if that all could happen in that office, right, or at least a big hunk of it, until we got to the point where it says, yes, you're a candidate to be inside our heroic healthcare system, and now we're going to admit you in the hospital, and then that system's gonna take over. Right now, what we have is this gigantic gap between when you're really sick and the rest of your life, right? There's no, you're not really managed in that process. The payers are starting to do that, but that's not what happens, and we're trying to close that gap with our patient-centered telemedicine solutions. Very good, and finally, we'll let Alex have her say as well. I have no slides. <laughs> Don't <but> apologize. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, I just want to pick up on this sense of what the healthcare system is 
And as somebody who works at agencies that are really at the forefront of transforming healthcare marketing and really embrace the opportunity to see all the new technologies and how they've changed the way people form opinions and make decisions today, people, whether they're doctors, patients, caregivers, family members and friends, when it comes to health care, the way a decision gets made today is dramatically different than it was just maybe five um, and certainly ten years ago. And the notion that the health care system was a series of institutions or um, ethical medical professionals who, and, and then insurance companies with the advent of managed care that made up the, deci the, the deciding body. They were the deciders. And what we see fundamentally has shifted is that the deciders, to borrow, I love Jean's um, comment about the doctor is the second opinion. The first opinion, the consensus that gets built is the consensus that the patient builds for their own truth. They're looking at a lot of different inputs now. They have access to most of the same information that a physician had access to. They might not understand it all, and they might not go and seek all those same inputs out but they seek many, many inputs out, both social inputs, institutional inputs, uh, things from the lay press, and what they're doing along the way is deciding what's right for them, including what their doctor said to them. Did what my doctor say to me today make sense with that article I read in the New York Times this weekend with what happened to my friend's daughter and what happened in this community site that I visit frequently? Did that make sense to me? Do I believe that? Am I going to act on that? I think one of the most wonderful things that's happened with the advent of digital technology in particular is that as people's impression of the healthcare system has declined, right? We all think it sucks a lot worse now than it did when we were kids. <laughs> um, and our, and that, that sense of decline really comes from this sense of lack of access. Another thing Gene said, he spends hours with his doctor. Nobody spends hours with their doctor anymore. Nobody's doctor knows them from an apple from a hole in the ground. Um, they spend 10 or 15 minutes. A quality consult is 15 minutes. Um, you're lucky if you get that. Um, the average pediatrician has 4,000 patients. So the idea that you have lack of access, and this is driving your anxiety about what exactly the quality of the care is you're getting, at the same time entered the internet. So just as managed markets were causing capitation and all these access issues for us as individuals, in came digital media and opened up a wealth of information that we can now garner and use to help us become the first opinion. And this idea that we're in charge and we're in control, by the way, isn't something that we, if I speak about us as patients, are embracing with great gusto. We're scared, we're resentful, it's not getting cheaper. So one of the things that I think when we think about technology is that we in fact do not have a technology problem. I do think that we have two other kinds of problems. One is we have an objective, I don't think it's a problem, it's a objective sort of dilemma. The objective right now for a lot of technology in healthcare is data capture. It's about getting the data into records, into file formats that can be shared. What is that doing to the doctor and patient exchange? Mm -hmm. Because what happens when you go to the doctor when the objective of technology is to make the doctor a data entry guy mm -hmm. or make the nurse a data entry nurse? So they're sitting there, you're there with all your problems in your heart on your sleeve and the doctor's looking into a screen, typing away, making sure all the fill fields are filled out, completely disrupted that relationship. So yes, we're deploying technology, but only in service, it seems to me right now, to get the data capture game fixed. The other thing we ha problem we have, if one is an objective issue, the other one is an attitude problem. <laughs> I think that there's an attitude problem. You know, I describe patients coming in having put real calories in the game now, spending maybe a couple hours, maybe more than that, if it's your kid or your husband or your mom, trying to figure out what that rash was, what that pain might be caused from. And you bring a file folder in. And I think that there's real intelligence in that file folder from somebody who really cares, the patient, the caregiver. And this is what the doctor does. Put your little chart aside. And this is what the patient does. I, I printed this stuff out from the internet. Will you? 
because they're ashamed and they feel like they have to apologize. And the doctor makes them feel ashamed by saying, put that stuff out away. I have to start over with my data capture process. <laughs> so here we are in the middle of technology is doing amazing things for so many things that we do in life. But I agree with John Scully. It's really back, it's 10 years behind what technology's done for the travel industry, for the financial services industries, for you name it. Healthcare is at least a decade behind really looking at the opportunity of technology to improve experiences, to not just improve accuracy, and accuracy is up most important in healthcare, but the experience that happens between a doctor and a patient is something that we're not really even operating on yet as entrepreneurs, as technologists, as designers. The user experience, and if we can get those patients to feel incented, included, part of the system, not the object of the system, not the problem that the system has to solve, but actually an included part of the system that's going to solve the problems and close some of the gaps by taking responsibility because they feel confident and able to do it and they feel valued, we're going to have some real breakthroughs. Very good. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Um, feel free to come up if you have any questions. I'm going to start off with uh, really jumping off your comment, which is something I wanted. I like to explain things through case studies, uh, and that's the way I do it. And I think the PHR debacle is a uh, pretty decent case study, and I'll, I'll give my comments around it and let you guys really answer the question that's the end of it, which is, y you know, PHRs didn't work. Um, that's, that's where we sit. They still aren't really working. Uh, patient portals are starting to work a little better now, but uh, PHRs in Google Health, for example, didn't work. Um, they didn't work for a lot of reasons, but I would say the first reason around it is the doctor is embedded in this, in this issue, and it's around trust. Um, like you said, if you brought a PHR into a doctor, why should they trust that information? Um, they are, you know, and because, because patients do lie. Patients will lie on that PHR. There's certain things, that, and, they, and it doesn't, they're, they're people like you and me. They're not following rational, logical decisions. They're making an emotional decision that's probably based on nothing about them not wanting to reveal this or that, or maybe it does have a real issue around insurance. And then on the other side, you have the patient who uh, didn't see that much value in doing those things. And it was very hard to get someone, even people that you could, I mean, I could explain it to my parents, you need to do this, you, you have to redo these tests every time you go to the doctor, um, and they still wouldn't do it. Uh, my question is, how are we going to fix that? Uh, what are we going to do to get that trust between the doctor and the patient? How are we gonna get the patient to do it, and how are we going to get the doctor to get information that they'll be able to really use, and, and what will that be? And I'm asking it open. Well, I'm, uh, you raise your hand, but yeah. I want to jump in, because I have a strong doctor-patient relationship. Uh, many years ago, I, I came down with a back problem whose symptoms were numbness in my left arm, dizziness, and pain in my chest. <laughs> Those aren't good symptoms for back pain. <laughs> and, and I went to my doctor thinking I, I'm on my deathbed, and he, she said, Oh, sober up, you're healthy, you have a back problem. Why could she do that? She knew me. She, she had seen over years my experience. And I don't think you can ever solve this problem by making the doctor-patient relationship less. It needs to be more, and, and, and Alex, you made a comment, and, and, I, and I'll jump on you, on um, accuracy. I don't think we need accuracy, we need consistency. Uh, I, I fear accuracy says I need now my blood pressure to be to the nearest tenth rather than knowing that it went up. And so that I, I don't worry about accuracy. I worry about uh, relevant, relevance. Yeah, so, so um, I got to be at the birth of Health Vault. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the things that, that uh, really, I think, um, and a way of kind of looking at technologies like PHRs and platforms for that is really about how do you help people um, not forget to have that increased consistency. I think the challenge with the PHR is when, and, and it's been stated here on this panel in terms of what are you going to do with it if you had it? And it was, that was for the EMR, but for the PHR, what would you do if you had it? And I think that it's really it, thought of as a passive repository of information. Um, no, it's not very exciting. But if you looked at it and said, instead, how do I think about 
preparing myself in a consistent way to take advantage of that 15 minutes that I'm going to have. Because you really are the advocate. I mean, we can have HIEs and all kinds of different technologies try to connect. At the end of the day, one of the most consistent conduits of information is a patient as they move among the system. And so how is it that you equip a patient to maintain a consistent conversation on their own behalf or a caregiver on their behalf throughout the rest of the care system so that they feel prepared when they go in and have that conversation so they don't feel like um, they could be misquoted because the last time they didn't quite get it right or they forgot what medication they're on and they don't actually say because they feel embarrassed because they forgot. And I do think there's this challenge. We tend to think about things as errors of commission, right? All the patients are going to be lying because what they're going to try to do is get oxycodone. Now, most patients have an agency that's aligned with their health. They want to get better. They want to know what's going on. They want to know why their child's sick. They want to know why, what they can do for their parent. And we tend to look to the negative instead of maybe most people just don't remember and they feel intimidated in that particular setting. And you know, from our perspective, you know, I do the same thing now with biometrics. I want to help people capture so that when they, they go in and have that conversation, they can say, you know what, I haven't, I'm just not feeling the way that I, I think I should be feeling. And I've got some objective data here that I've been able to capture. And I not, don't know the answer, but I, I would like to be prepared to have that conversation with you because I know that we don't have much time yep. to have that conversation. Yeah, I couldn't agree more that uh, in, in healthcare, Positive trumps, trumps negative every time. If you, you know that uh, certain marketing techniques and such that work in other industries that rely heavily on fear marketing and things like that, don't transition well into healthcare. Positive, you know, don't ever undersell the patients. Patients can do a whole lot. Um, go ahead. Yeah, I was, was going to comment on the personal health record because I, I think um, the initial pass at it. Um, was the, you know, it had a flawed premise. So the idea of a personal health record, it's my health record that I care about and it's engaging to me. But what was actually built was really a, a repository to perform the function of me as a Sherpa yes. for data because the system doesn't do it, right? And so, and the problem of course with that is the visual of the stack of paper. You put yourself in the shoe of the doctor. I have to see 30 people today. Okay, you just gave me 90 minutes of reading here. Okay, there's absolutely no way I can effectively consume this information, which by the way, I don't even know if I can trust it, as you said. So he pushes it off to the side. The, the, I, you know, the closest thing I think of for me personally as a personal health record was my Weight Watchers portal, right? For me, the personal health challenge that I was more focused on was you know, maintaining my weight at a healthy weight, because that's my health problem that engages me now. If I had diabetes, I'd want to see my glucose readings and probably watch my weight and do stuff like that. I haven't seen that solution developed. I, I, I agree that, the inter, again, the interface isn't taking cues from modern successful mm -hmm interfaces that also triage complex things mm -hmm. and complex things that people don't like to engage with like their personal finances mm -hmm. you know but bringing those kinds of solutions to healthcare so you can get the patient from feeling like they're just filling out forms for the doctor as opposed to filling out forms for their family mm -hmm. filling out forms for their own you know benefit as of a legacy look at you know people will spend hours on ancestry.com you know <laughs> But they won't spend, you know, 15 minutes. And I think that the design of the actual form mats and the way we create engagement around them, we just haven't been imaginative enough. Mm -hmm. And it's not like it doesn't exist in other industries and other paradigms. It does. We just have to bring it to healthcare now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the opportunity to uh, educate and, and, and uh, from zero to 100 um, around healthcare things is, is quite easy. They, they've done clinical trials 100% online, recruited people, they did their testing, they got it all done, trained everything online. Um, uh, completely a huge cost saving things, but the thing that enabled it was the ability to teach and communicate to the average person on the internet in an effective manner. We have a question in the back, I thought, get you before we uh, run out of time here, go ahead. Oh, um, 
As a uh, physician and entrepreneur, I certainly see the promise of digital health. However, I followed the healthcare reform process, both uh, with, uh, both PPAC and high tech, and I uh, I see that uh, part of the methodology really is to reduce physician reimbursement, empower lower cost providers, and use technology to allow that process to happen so that you're more likely to see your nurse practitioner, physician assistant, or physician extender rather than actually see your physician in the future. And technologies, in my, my opinion, my cynical opinion in this case, is going to be used to facilitate that process so we can actually reduce cost to the system. What are your thoughts on that comment and uh, would you see it as cynically as I, as I just portrayed it? I'll let you guys have that. I mean, I agree. Uh, the, you know, the, the government is the number one payer and the problem they have is costs keep going up and so they put these programs in place to reduce costs, not to at the same time maintain health and all that. But the, the focus is in what ways can I use you know, information systems to drive costs down by you know, reducing fraud, unnecessary procedures, et cetera, et cetera. And so it's not, it's, you know, it's really kind of a, you know, a management system for the payer. And, and I would say, I think it's fabulous that we're going to have, be able to distribute something as valuable to human health as nursing through the virtualization <laughs> of, uh, of uh, technology. You know, and, and I think that w it's because we've only looked at it as a way to save money, mm -hmm. not as a way to provide better quality care. You know, the right kind of nursing intervention in the right time frame provides great clinical and therapeutic value for less money. We should be trying to do that. But we should be looking at it maybe not just from a sense of cutting costs, but from a sense of how do we enhance the value of care or how do we create better care. And you know, I don't think by any stretch of our imagination we're putting doctors out of business in this um, kind of pursuit. We're just making better care, the right care, more accessible to more people. Well, see, and Alex, I was sitting over here trying to figure out how many transistors would replace it. <laughs> it's got to be less than a billion. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's but be, I, so, but just, you know, I, I think that, that um, you, you know, when we think about, and I, I, I once heard a, a health economist talk about this notion of, you know, we're an industry in which um, we consume the largest segment of the gross domestic product of any industry in the country. And he, he looked at it in his audience and he said, stop apologizing. Mm -hmm. He said, you guys are just apologizing. He said, there's a, every other industry, and you go walk the floor here, every other industry would kill to be in the position that you guys are in. He said, your problem is a value problem. You're not creating the value for the amount of money that you're actually consuming in the, in, in the economy. And that's what's frustrating people. They look at it and they feel like they're not getting from the dollar spent the return, the relative return. And so when you look at it and you go, okay, as a national, uh, from a national health statistical perspective, we're a low performer relative to developed economies. And yet we spend significantly more. And, and so it's, I, I do think we have to get at how do we unearth the value generation um, not just cut costs. We're not going to cut our uh, cut our way to um, incredible value. I don't think. I think we're going to have to make some different types of investments in different categories. And I do think there'll be an opportunity for disruptive technologies to potentially push that value up. Um, yeah, but that's to be very clear. EMRs in the first two years do not save money. Um, EMRs are very expensive and they take a lot of time to train up. And when you're talking, and they don't take too much time, but when you're talking a doctor's time, that is the single resource that takes up more uh, cost than any other thing in a doctor, a physician's practice. And so it's things like, you know, I mentioned high tech and other, other things, you know, EMR implementation in the short run is not gonna save money by any means. It's other things. It's like enabling lower uh, professional uh, uh, things like nursing, even care managers, things like that, to, to do more things through things like technology that's really gonna, gonna push the uh, industry forward. Um, there was one last question I wanted to just really, you know, the, the, the title of this was how technology is changing the relationship. And we hit on a lot of it, but I wanted to end on, you know, wh what are the real challenges we're dealing with here? Are the outright negative things that, 
that technology is really in, in interfering with the round thing. We, we really do and we really know how positive stuff is going to happen. I mean, I, I truly believe that's snowballing. But the, all, the, the real question to someone like me now is how do we can avoid the pitfalls that are going to happen, that are likely to happen if we don't as an industry really push together. So um, some ways in my easy example to throw a soft one is, is uh, the hypochondriac kind of mentality that uh, uh, younger uh, patients or any patients start getting with this massive uh, influx of information. I just wanted to uh, open that up to everyone while we got a couple minutes here. Well, I mean, I'll, uh, to me, I think <laughs> the biggest thing that has to happen is a switching of accountability. And accepting of the accountability for our health care as individuals. Mm. And, and then uh, we have to change. We have a perverse payment system that does not have anybody, everybody aligned in the right way. What if when I had an encounter with my doctor, he looked me in the eyes, and when he recommended something, he knew I was paying for it. And I started to act like, and I started to consume health care, and I said, is that really necessary? I mean, is there a cheaper way to do that? Is there, and I know people don't want to do that, but um, at the end of the day, you know, most of these procedures that we've done are actually have negative to utility to us, right? It's all relative to what we think will happen if we don't do it. And what we know now through genomics and that sort of thing is that, you know, more, almost half of the stuff we're doing to people isn't actually improving their, out. If they wouldn't have done it, they probably would have been just as well off, yep. maybe even better. So, so, so let me jump in there because I, I think you made a comment earlier. Uh, and, and the worry I have is what we accuse technology of being able to do is create data. Mm -hmm. It can also create information. And uh, I've seen many industries go through this path of, gee, we have all this data, what do we do with it? Well, I don't need the data. I need a yes or no. I need to understand. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Let's see Jill sitting over there, so I think All we're right. done. No, thanks everyone so much. Thank you, panel. It was really great. I think we've got a lot to talk about. Thank you. Thanks.